Thanks for listening to Star Lores. If you like the show, please consider subscribing and giving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help us make more great content by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com. We would also love to hear from you on social media. You can follow Star Lores on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Enjoy the show, and may the Force be with you. You are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. The Jedi philosophy is one of the oldest and preeminent teachings in the galaxy, and the Jedi Order is one of the largest groups of adherents at varying times throughout galactic history. Although it has been pushed to the verge of extinction on multiple occasions, and remade with varying doctrines outside of its core teachings, both Jedi and the Sith originate thousands of years ago on the planet Tython, near the center of the galaxy, where the Jedi, spelt J E apostrophe D-A-I-I, the precursors to the Jedi and the Sith had split into two factions. Initially, the Jedi believed in the unifying force and a balance between light and dark. 34,000 years before the Battle of Yavin in A New Hope, on the deep core world of Tython, the Tho Yor large interstellar pyramid-like spacecraft gathered a sampling of four sensitive species from across the galaxy to deliver them to Tython. These four sensitives would come to form the Jedi, an order dedicated to understanding the fullness of the Force and strive to maintain the balance between the light and the dark. For over a thousand years, the Jedi studied the Force and developed various disciplines. However, after the Force Wars, a violent and bloody philosophical schism, the Jedi split into those who believed that the light side of the force was inherently good and rejected the use of the dark side, while dark Jedi embraced it in rejection of the light side. The dark side users were defeated and left the world, while the now reformed Jedi sought to leave Tython in order to escape the instability caused in the world's biosphere after the conflict had destabilized the planet's delicately balanced force-based ecosystem. After leaving Tython, the now-reformed Jedi, led by the Jedi Council, settled on the planet Osis, in the galactic outer rim, away from the core worlds, in order to avoid the growing political influence of the newly emerged Galactic Republic. Creating a strict code to govern their behavior after the terrible Force Wars, and prevent future generations of Jedi from becoming corrupted by the dark side, The Jedi Council created the Jedi Code, and a series of monastic regulations, vows, and disciplines. The Jedi continue to recruit new Force sensitives from across the galaxy to join their order. Eventually, the fledging Galactic Republic re-established contact with the Jedi Order on Osis, and following a cataclysmic event on the planet, the Jedi Order was forced to relocate to Coruscant the capital of the Republic. After a series of conflicts with the resurgent dark side followers in the form of the Sith Empire, the Jedi had become and would remain guardians and protectors of the Galactic Republic for millennia to come. Their influence over the galaxy would wax and wane through various conflicts against the Sith and other political and social movements, as well as internal and external threats to the Republic and the Order would have been brought to the brink of destruction many times over. Eventually, the Order was destroyed along with the Republic by the Sith following the tumultuous years of the Clone Wars. The new Jedi Order would be resurrected under the leadership of Luke Skywalker following the destruction of the Galactic Empire. 
The new order would last for hundreds of years following another brush with destruction. It would become integrated with the First Galactic Federation hundreds of years after Luke's death. Use the Force, Luke. Let go, Luke. There are a number of varying beliefs within the Jedi, but all Orthodox teachings hold this central tenets to be true. First and foremost, they adhere to the light side of the Force. To choose the path of the Jedi was to adopt a complete moral philosophy that would guide the entirety of your life. They adopted an ascetic lifestyle, which focused the Jedi's whole being on the pursuit of knowledge, understanding of the Force. They sacrificed their lives in pursuit of higher understanding of the Force with all other desires and needs dedicated to this task. They promoted peace and harmony with all life, as it all shares the unifying thread of the Force. The Jedi did not believe in personal attachment, as they taught that attachments could eventually lead down a slippery slope of emotions that led to the dark side. This view on attachment took on two interpretations, that of attachment to material objects and that of attachment to close personal relationships. Instead, they dedicate their time to establishing connections and relationships to all life, from plants and animals to sentient beings of all species, as well as establishing connections to other Jedi. This would inform their belief in taking on new students at a very young age, before they were able to develop possessive instincts towards their birth families, and would also forbid marriage or conjugal attachments to others, all of which helped to better indoctrinate the infants in the way of the Jedi. They do not believe in the possession of personal wealth, and would often don plain robes and possess very little material value. The Jedi would often spend their time training and disciplining their minds and bodies and honing their abilities with the lightsaber, as well as meditating on the Force. The Jedi valued internal and external peace and tranquility, and following their partnership with the Galactic Republic, would spend their time problem solving, negotiating resolutions to conflicts, and act as police and peacekeepers, sometimes regrettably having to use lethal force to defend the weak or themselves against violent aggressors. The Jedi also believed in compassionate actions towards others and avoided conflict wherever possible. Ultimately, the Jedi adopted a written code that summed up their philosophy. Though it has undergone several variations in wording, it has been refined as such. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is the Force. When Luke restarted the Jedi Order, he had an alternative version of the code. Jedi are the guardians of peace in the galaxy. Jedi use their powers to defend and to protect. Jedi respect all life in any form. Jedi serve others rather than ruling over them for the good of the galaxy. Jedi seek to improve themselves through knowledge and training. Beyond the philosophical code, the Jedi adopted a number of administrative practices that would become hallmarks of the Order, but may have been modified as a practice over time or dropped altogether. Although not a foundational tenet, the later Jedi would adopt a rule to only take one apprentice at a time. Luke Skywalker's new Jedi Order would revise this largely due to the shortage in trained Jedi and the need to rebuild the Order. Rules forbidding marital attachment. Luke's resurgent order would again revise this, as Luke himself would take on a wife as head of the order. In the old order, celibacy was often practiced, with few exceptions. Because of this, the Jedi do not breed new members into the order and recruit from elsewhere. Children were often chosen to be instructed into the ways of the Jedi. In the first days of the order, this would start at early childhood and would eventually include taking on infants. This practice was not always observed, but became common during the Old Republic era. Age caps were put in place after influential writings of Jedi Master Simicardi. Jedi who failed in their training, or who failed to uphold the code, could be expelled, either due to a flaw in their character, unwillingness to accept the rulings of the Order, or by being too willing to flirt with the teachings of the Dark Side. Jedi who failed in their trials, but otherwise showed virtue, may also find a place amongst the Jedi Service Corps. 
Jedi would shape their lives around the code and practice their monastic lifestyles focusing on the following virtues. Self-discipline. Jedi students would learn to discipline themselves and restrain their base urges and emotions. They would learn humility to conquer arrogance. Jedi were not to be self-aggrandizing in their abilities to use the Force and would consider themselves no better than any other living being. Hubris, overconfidence, and defeatism were all to be avoided as Jedi. Jedi were to let go of their own personal pride and to avoid stubbornness. They were taught to see situations and conflicts from multiple perspectives, including that of their opponents, and attempt to understand them. A peaceful outcome was the best outcome, and Jedi taught to see past the binary of simple winning and losing. With self-restraint, Jedi were also taught to forego their own desires, their own feelings of anger or aggression, and in the combat orientation of their teachings, are allowed only to kill out of self-defense, and when every alternative solution had been exhausted. With the powerful mind-altering and thought-sensing abilities, Jedi were also not to use the Force to unnecessarily violate the privacy or agency of others unless in service to a greater cause. They were also not to use their abilities to control or manipulate others unless a conflict could be resolved with such tactics. Using such abilities flagrantly and without regard would be a violation of the autonomy of others and would breed distrust of the Jedi. The Jedi divide their teachings into three pillars of study. The first pillar, the Force, to explore the higher mysteries and spiritual connection of the Force. The second pillar, knowledge, to expand the mind and exercise the mental acuity and understanding of the world as, and its inhabitants, as well as mastering mental instincts and base desires. The third pillar, self-discipline to conquer the material needs of the body and master physical discipline, including exercise regimens and fighting styles. For thousands of years, the Jedi Order would use numerous emblems to denote function, roles, and ranks, yet all were unified under the symbol of an ignited wing lightsaber, which would be representative of the Order until its destruction. Under Luke Skywalker's reformation, they adopted a modified New Republic starbird symbol encircled by a ring and multi-pointed star. The Jedi Order has had, for the longest time, a particular aesthetic. Other than ceremonial robes, worn in conjunction with particular roles, most Jedi wore plain tan, brown, and in some cases black robes, often used to denote a Jedi Master, and tunics that reflected the Spartan and aesthetic teachings of the Jedi. The cloth itself was often of a rough material meant to cause enough discomfort to keep a Jedi focused and tough enough that it would provide useful and durable in austere conditions and had thermosensitive qualities. Robes sometimes reflected a Jedi's achievements, such as the white ceremonial robes of ancient Jedi masters, or they reflected a particular philosophy as the gray robes traditionally worn by the gray Jedi. Some Jedi wore distinct robes, such as the delicately embroidered Anistan pattern robes that fit a particular role such as Jedi librarians or the unmistakable matching white outfits and ceremonial mask of the Jedi temple guards. Along with the ubiquitous lightsaber, Jedi would often have a utility belt with an assortment of pouches that contain rations and tools that they may require on any given assignment. They would often wear tough utility boots, which would be used in all manner of terrain or softer elegant boots if on diplomatic missions. While by no means uniform, Jedi were known to adopt variations on the basic Jedi attire and sometimes reflected a Jedi's personality, culture, or may adopt variations to match their unique physiology, in some cases foregoing clothing altogether. Additionally, certain styles and variations had been more or less popular within the ranks of the Jedi with cases of more and less elaborate robes over the thousands of years of their existence. During periods of protracted warfare, it was not uncommon for Jedi to adopt various forms of battle armor to increase their bodily protection and survivability in hostile environments. Jedi would sometimes use armor common to the warring faction or use custom light and flexible armor designed specifically to facilitate acrobatics and freedom of movement to maximize a Jedi's fighting style. More restrictive heavier armor would sometimes be used by individual Jedi, who valued greater protection over movement. Armor would sometimes restrict the use of a certain force power, 
Armor would often be used in conjunction with traditional robes, capes, and camas. Jedi would often utilize training suits that helped absorb blasts and impacts and had weighed components to better train the user's speed and endurance, but also making it impractical for battlefield use. This training suit was often used with the WJ-880 blinding helmet, which was used to train a Jedi to rely on sensing through the force rather than relying on physical auditory and optical inputs. The crystal is the heart of the blade. The heart is the crystal of the Jedi. The Jedi is the crystal of the Force. The Force is the blade of the heart. All are intertwined. The crystal, the blade, the Jedi. You are one. Although the Jedi believed in the sacred nature of all life, they were not strictly pacifists and would often take up arms for self-defense or for the defense of others. During the Force Wars, the followers of the Light and Dark Side, not yet Jedi or Sith, fought with metal-bladed swords, whose physical properties such as strength and sharpness were enhanced by the Force. Using technology from the ancient Rakata Empire that arrived on Tython, the warriors developed energy-based blades that would be the first lightsabers, the hallmark weapon of the Jedi and the Sith. The lightsaber was a cylindrical hilt that varied in design and construction that could project a focused beam of plasma energy focused through a force-sensitive crystal and encased in a force field. The blade can come in an assortment of colors determined by the crystal in its hilt. The Jedi created an assortment of fighting styles around the use of the lightsaber. Although capable of using blaster technology to great effect, the Jedi preferred to use the melee weapons as they felt them as an extension of their own body and could use them to great effect. They could be used defensively to deflect blaster fire and could be used as a cutting tool to create openings in the most hardened surfaces. The Jedi Order had an assortment of various ranks and roles and were broken down as such. Initiate. The infant force-sensitive recruits, training begins early around two to three standard years old. It is difficult to set an exact age due to the varying degrees of maturation of the various species that composed the Jedi Order. Where initiates li live and train in the Jedi Temple, benefiting from group instruction organized into clans by various Jedi instructors and having access to the vast databases of the Jedi Archives. The clans by which they were organized as infants learn and grow together, training, eating, and sleeping until they are individually selected by a knight or master to become an apprentice. This was done to foster a sense of family amongst the young aspirants. Initiates are often referred to as younglings, trainee, or Jedi hopeful, in the parlance of the late Republic. Initiates did not often venture outside of the walls of the Jedi Academy or Temple. Early training focused on understanding the Force, meditation, politics, and the study of cultures and history of the myriad species of the galaxy. Initiates were also subject to rigorous physical training, exercise, and acrobatics. Weapons training came only after sufficient competence in all other fields would be proven. They would become eligible for apprenticeship after passing the initiate trials. The initiate role was not the primary source of recruitment in the early days of the Jedi Order, who often recruited any species at any age to undergo Jedi training. Similarly, when the Jedi Order was resurrected by Luke Skywalker, he initially sought out Force sensitives regardless of age to begin rebuilding the numbers of the depleted Jedi. The Apprentice and Padawan Jedi Padawans are selected for one-on-one -on -one training by a Jedi Knight around adolescence. They begin to accompany knights or masters on missions off-world and can be exposed to the dangers of the galaxy at large. This phase ends when the apprentice is ready to begin the Jedi Trials in order to graduate to become a fully-fledged Jedi Knight. Padawans were often denoted by a braid, strand of hair, or if they were a species that did not grow hair, it was a cloth or beads which would be shorn off with the lightsaber upon knighthood or torn out if they had failed and been expelled from the order. Failure can occur at any time during training, and failed initiates or renegade knights and masters who are unable to demonstrate proper control over their abilities 
or violate the tenets of the code will be expelled from the order or reassigned to a menial role. Padawans would face another set of trials before they could be knighted. Jedi Knight Jedi Knights no longer serve under their tutor and are free to take on assignments across the galaxy and may even begin training their own apprentice. Jedi Knights could take on a number of specialized roles within the order based on a concentration or a particular talent, ability, or philosophical understandings of the Force. The Jedi Master Jedi who graduate and apprentice to knighthood obtain the rank of Jedi Master, further proving a mastery of the Force over the self. Masters often comprise the leadership of the Jedi Order, often would be sought out for wisdom and guidance in a particular area. Masters were also known to continue to take on apprentices or focus on their own singular development. Jedi Grand Master Jedi Grand Master is held as an honorary title for the most revered or venerable Jedi Masters, often found on the Jedi High Council. Master of the Order The Master of the Order was the head of the Jedi High Council and de facto leader of the entire Order. They would have the final say in decision-making. Often, the Master of the Order would have the dual role of Jedi Grand Master. In addition to the rank structure, there were many specialized roles within the Jedi Order, with an array of functions, focuses, and duties that helped the organization operate, from day-to-day -day functions to specialized tactical and diplomatic roles. Jedi Lord A special, honorary title given to the Jedi during the period of the New Sith Wars, Jedi Lords held fortifications over key planetary systems during the conflict. During wartime, Jedi were often granted formal military ranks to better enforce a chain of command hierarchy when working with Republic military assets, including ranks such as Commander and General. High Councils Leadership of the Jedi Order falls to a series of four councils, each of which occupy one of the spires of the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. The Council of First Knowledge is in charge of educating young and up-and-coming Jedi and storing and managing the accumulated knowledge of the Jedi Order in the archives and dispensing that knowledge to the rest of the Order. It was headed by the caretaker of First Knowledge and would convene in the Tower of First Knowledge. The Council of Reconciliation works with political bodies to negotiate peace and diplomacy. Made up of five Jedi Masters, this council worked closely with the Galactic Senate and external political bodies. The council would also sometimes undertake a secondary role of adjudicators of internal affairs, trying Jedi accused of criminal activity or cavorting with the dark side of the Force. They would convene in the Tower of Reconciliation. The Council of Reassignment, led by five Jedi Masters, this council oversaw the Jedi Service Corps, managing failed Jedi aspirants. They also assigned Jedi who wanted to volunteer in specialized roles under its auspices, such as the Jedi Medical Corps or the Agricultural Corps. The High Council. It is the highest and final authority of the Jedi Order. It consisted of 12 of the wisest Jedi Masters and was headed by the elected Master of the Order, who usually, but not always, also held the title of Grand Master. It was the only body with the authority to formally bestow knighthood on Jedi though this was sometimes flexible due to times of crisis and expediency. Members often held positions on one or more of the three other councils, and they also oversaw the numerous minor councils that led many satellite Jedi academies, temples, and praxiums across the galaxy. There were many minor Jedi councils that led Jedi enclaves on different planets, but were all ultimately subservient to the four councils on Coruscant. Overall, the number of Jedi, its roles and functions in the galaxy waxed and waned, on multiple occasions, being reduced to a handful on the brink of extinction to numbering over 10,000 before the Clone Wars. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. The Jedi Order is more of a religious organization than a political body, but maintains a unique relationship with the Galactic Republic having been appointed as its guardians, even though they may view themselves as largely apolitical. The special relationship between the Jedi and the Republic was fostered at the very inception of the Republic, 
when the Jedi came to their aid against the ancient Sith empires. The Jedi's main goal is peace and balance, which they believe the Galactic Republic is the best means to this end, and therefore undertake its protection. The Jedi have had many buildings throughout the millennia from which to live, train, and practice their beliefs. These structures are referred to as Jedi temples, and they dot the planets all across the galaxy, often built on powerful force convergences or on the source of kyber crystals used in the construction of the lightsabers. Jedi te temples range from relatively small austere structures to grand multiplex ornate edifices. Temples often contain some repository of accumulated knowledge and act as a base of operations or sanctuary for traveling Jedi. Jedi temples are known to have statues of ancient Jedi, force shrines, and hollow projections of historical events. Ancient Jedi ruins of long abandoned or destroyed temples can also be found across the galaxy. The Jedi Order's greatest temple and headquarters is found on Coruscant, the head of the Order's operations and central training facilities. This had been moved from the previous Jedi headquarters on the planet Osis, which itself had been moved from Tython, the origin of the Jedi. These are not the only temples, however, and many temples were in concurrent use at the height of the Jedi's power. So, Jordan, for the discussion part of our episode, uh, we're going to discuss everything about the Jedi, the controversial, the unknown, and uh, what our opinions are on it. Okay, sounds fun. Uh, so, first off, I think the biggest thing is, are the Jedi right about the Force? Uh, the Force kind of transcends like the individual beliefs of a lot of the factions in Star Wars. Um, I think the audience is led to believe that the Jedi are the good guys just based on the fact that the protagonists of the story, but are they right in their interpretation of the Force? And what does balance mean to the Jedi between light and dark? Um, my opinion is that Jedi are not, they are right about certain aspects of the Force, but the Jedi are very much dogmatic and ideological about the force and i think um obviously that's that's may credit to like the new movies they kind of dip their toes in that a little bit but they don't really go into it much but i think probably some of the um material outside of the movies explores that more uh but yeah it, it definitely seems apparent to me that the jedi are definitely uh, ideological like it's they're not looking at the force as just because the force as we've discussed it here previously yeah is it's like a force of nature almost like it just it's, it's like, a matter of fact it, it's yeah. sort of like gravity it's, yeah. it's just there right and and i don't know if that's the best analogy but in in the sense that uh it is there it precedes you and it will be there after you. Um, I think that the way they yield the force and interact with the force is embedded within a sort of philosophical, even ideological framework. So that's kind of my opinion on, uh, I don't think, I think they are right about the force in a lot of ways, but they can also be wrong about it. It's like they're not infallible, like maybe the movies would lead you to believe. Yeah, I, I think I 100% I agree with you, particularly about the, uh, like, you can see it at different phases if you know more about, like, the Jedi's history. At certain times, they become more, like, you know, stuck on their doctrine versus, like, you know, feeling the Force as they, you know, purport to, to believe. Um the other thing, too, is I believe there are conflicting ideologies within the Jedi. And at some point, we will delve deeper into it. But for now, I'm just going to say I think the belief system of the Grey Jedi is closer to a, a balanced perspective of what the Force is than just the Jedi's like purest ideology. Um, and the other thing, too, about balance between light and dark, I think the Jedi interpret that to mean the light side winning or the light side being in charge or the only thing or almost that the light side is the balance yeah exactly right the, in and of itself like that their interpretation of the force 
is balance of, in the forest, right? Yeah. But so, and so that's where I think you know they they try to eliminate the dark side, and I think that's where the Jedi, the gray Jedi, are are uh, are right in that they embrace both sides. They you know the force is an all encompassing thing, and then you can use it for good or for evil, right? It it, it depends on the user. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll delve more into that. That's a little bit out of the scope of this episode, but I just wanted to touch on it because it's relevant to that question. Yeah. Um, so how do you think that the Jedi Order is flawed or corrupt or were they hypocritical? Uh, yeah, I think the same thing applies where you have to look at different periods in their history, but there are definite times where it's more evident than others. Um. I think one is sometimes they become very stuck on their ideology and like in the case of Anakin Skywalker, like it makes them kind of isolate and push him out, you know, um, they kind of like, they isolate people and this has happened not only to him, like other Jedi, like Count Dooku, um, had felt isolated. Qui-Gon Jinn was, you know, had the wherewithal to stay on the, on the good side of the council, but he's often ostracized or kind of put on the fringe because yeah. he's not in line with what the Jedi Council determines to be the right path. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I also wonder too, is like, there is a sort of very unrealistic portrayal of the Jedi that doesn't seem, I guess I'm just trying to think of it in like human terms. Um, but uh, like, the, it doesn't appear the veneer of the Jedi is that they're not interested in self interest whatsoever right that like like on paper they're not supposed to yeah be. and uh, that almost i think everybody fundamentally has some kind of like what would be called like rational self-interest you know where it's it's like you're you you have some interest in your own well-being right and your own advancement so to speak but the jedi they seem to portray themselves as as not that at all I, well, I think it's not that they're trying to portray it. I think they genuinely believe it. And I think that's where they might be perceived as hypocritical is when the natural thing is to be a self-interested. So when, or even like, so for the Jedi Order to preserve itself as as a, a philosophy, sometimes they need to act in the Jedi Order's self-interest, right? Right. Um, so that kind of will come into conflict with like, oh, well, we don't believe in self-interest. Right, yeah. But, you know, they'll might take an action that like, okay, we need to preserve our beliefs, our ideology. We need to fight against people who are looking to persecute our beliefs and ideology, right? Yeah. Um, and then that turns into self-interest. There's an interesting character from the Old Republic. Um, his name is Lucien Dre. And uh, I think kind of speaking to the corruption or what can be corrupted within the Jedi Order, he ends up taking very drastic actions by exterminating a bunch of Padawans who they thought might resurrect the dark side. Hmm. Uh, he had a pretty, he was a pretty high ranking Jedi. Uh, and he had a small cadre of Jedi that went along with it as well. So they killed these children based on a vision that they had about the, the, the potential of what might happen in the future. Very, uh, minority report ish right mm -hmm. so it brings those questions in like jedi are known to have the power of foresight they can see visions so we know it's a possibility that they could have been right but yep. were their actions <clears throat> right mm -hmm. so that's the other way they can be corrupted is becoming too self-righteous and thinking like yeah. you know the ends justify the means and whatever path they choose to take and again this is a historical event that occurred that shows when in a in a period of time that the jedi may have like you know been corrupted or lost their path yeah the final thing I would say, and in more recent terms, would be um, the Jedi's involvement with politics. I think they maybe overstep with how they how involved they become with galactic affairs, and I think uh, a bit of that corruption comes from like their need to be either too passive with things or become too aggressive. So, in the terms of like the Clone Wars, for example, they become direct military actors. They become part of the military institution of what are essentially like slave soldiers. Yeah, yeah. All of which are counter to what the Jedi believe at the core of their philosophy. Yeah. So. And in a way, like the <clears throat> the whole the uh, the Galactic Empire couldn't have even been possible without the Jedi Council's help previously. Yeah. In a way, they 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 
mastered their own destruction. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, and and to be fair, like they were being manipulated at the time. We know that for like, sure. They would have sure. done it, but but they were manipulated. They allowed themselves yeah. to become manipulated. That's yes, co- yeah, exactly. sort of the thing. Right? So they they bought into it. They thought what they were doing was for the greater good of galactic politics, and it ended up backfiring horrifically. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I kind of wonder about that if it's uh if uh again it's it is more of that like self-righteous thing like they they so strongly believe that the uh it's sort of like this um there's this concept that actually Hayek talks about Friedrich Hayek uh Austrian economist from like 50 years ago uh but he would talk about like the pretense of knowledge and the idea that like we actually know enough to and he would talk about it in terms of the economy but that we know enough to actually like um plan and control an economy and that we have all the relevant information that we need and we can like plan and control the whole economy yeah and uh, like account for be, every variable yeah, yeah. It, because of our good intentions right and yeah. but it, it almost seems like the jedi have this pretense of knowledge like they yeah. they believe that like they know exactly how to how things should yeah, be yeah what what levers to pull and whatnot in order to um form the galaxy in terms of yeah and that's exactly yeah. how palpatine frames the jedi right? yeah, he's exactly. like look they're trying to enforce their will on on the rest of us right yeah, we yeah. shouldn't allow that to happen yeah um which ends up being their own undoing even if that's not really what their intent was yeah um it still comes off that way right yeah absolutely um, the other thing too, I was going to say about their involvement in, in galactic politics, and in a way, like the because they are too entrenched with the Senate, the Senate's corruption can be attributed to the Jedi's corruption. The Jedi are too passive, and they allow bad things to happen across the galaxy. Um, there are cases, countless cases in the Clone Wars, where they support like despotic governments, right? Uh, because they are on the Republic side, right? Yeah, you know, only even though uh morally or according to the jedi's moral code they would be enemies right yeah but they're forced to support them yeah and institutions like slavery um yeah. which are rampant in the star wars galaxy the jedi kind of you know they play within the rules of it there may be movements to try and stop it i, I have never read anything about it but they're at least permissive of these institutions yeah totally so it, 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 and again going back to like a, a modern almost um contrast is like like canada like we're in canada and you know we support the saudi arabian government but at the same time we say we're all about gender equality or whatnot right, right. like exactly and it's like okay we're kind of speaking on out of both sides of our yeah, mouth it's, it's we, we, we only we only like it when it's like beneficial to us right and a lot of that is politics and yeah, that's why yeah. i'm saying like the jedi the more they become involved with politics totally. they, they they take play. on yeah. the the moral gray areas yeah, yeah. that politicians often are forced to do maybe for, for sure yeah. for for the greater balance of peace or whatever their their calculation is yeah you know it could be just even a, i want to stay in power i want to be voted in I'll compromise on this, right? And that's kind of the problem is like you almost need a a separation of church and state within the the, the Star Wars universe. Yeah, within yeah, the Star, Star Wars because then they get all these conflicted um interests uh involved in their own yeah, governance. Yeah. And right? that are counter to like the Jedi's core philosophy, yeah. but because of their politics are dragged into Totally, it. yeah. So a couple of final points on that uh, discussion point. Um I think the Jedi can also be accused of being overly um, persecutive towards the Sith as well. Um, obviously, a, one of the central conflicts of the entire Star Wars narrative, like for thousands of years, is the conflict between Jedi and Sith. And there are times where the Jedi, uh, like the example I just gave, uh, take it too far and go on like campaigns of extermination, right? Like it, essentially, what amounts to genocide, right? <laughs> um, because they think differently than they than them, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you could put up an argument, and when we discuss the Sith's philosophy, you could maybe argue that maybe the Sith ideology is too dangerous to be right yeah. entertained. Yeah. Um, but I think that will be a good topic to talk about when we talk about them. For sure. But I mean, if your core belief system is, you know the the sanctity of life i think it could be construed as being hypocritical to exterminate the opposing view 
Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the the Jedi's biggest flaw is maybe they just weren't on the lookout for the Sith enough, which led to their downfall. Maybe they you know became complacent after the Sith supposedly disappeared for so long, and they didn't even realize its influence and corruption in let's say the secular senate right the the secular world and so they became too lax in in keeping guard of the galaxy against the sith um and the last thing is uh luke's reformations i just wanted to touch on briefly i would argue that luke uh, when he re- resurrects the jedi order he kind of he sees a lot of the flaws of the old way a lot of the like i said like the or like you said earlier the ideologies and he makes them less stringent and he kind of he opens up the jedi philosophy to be more permissive of behaviors that would have been banned by the old jedi order i guess he's less textbook jedi and i think in a lot of ways that's a redeeming quality of his resurrected order which kind of brings me to my next point is uh is were the jedi wrong about attachment and love um were are they like human emotions that they were scared of because they're scared of all emotions are they running away from the good ones did they in in a way turn anakin to the dark side you know had they been just permissive of anakin and padme um as we know luke himself will eventually get married and be permissive of marriage in his new order so what are your thoughts on that um yeah, I think, like, on a visceral level, I feel that way. Like, you know, if that was if that were, if that was me in that position, I would definitely say that. But it is hard to say. Yeah, in some ways, like, the Jedi Order has been around for millennia, right? And they've developed this code and this way that's taken them thousands and thousands of years. Um, are they necessarily wrong to do it this way? Like, has it taken this long for them to come to these conclusions because of maybe bad effects that, like, we don't even totally understand? Yeah. Like, they have seen in the past. They, they so, have like, so much context to to make those rules with yeah. it. And that, like, like, for us, it just seems kind of silly. But, you know, that's the one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is to, like, um, very few people can can be that strict you know and live within boundaries like that so i i think it's like it's almost like it's unrealistic to even expect anyone that would join your order if you're if you're gonna be like uh that strict about it yeah and and that also i guess goes back to their recruiting policy right right they take you as a child so they don't know what you don't necessarily consent to to living like that so, yeah, and you know, uh, you're, you know, I'm sure there's people who would have like a good temperament for the Jedi Order, right? They, yeah, they even probably whole species who would be more inclined to live like that. But yeah, um, uh, yeah to sort of like just assume everyone carte blanche take yeah. on all these uh, people and then like make them live live these kind of lifestyles. It might be. It almost seems like it's it's well whether you think it's right or wrong it seems like it's just a disaster waiting to happen yeah that, just from a practical perspective yeah, totally, you can't yeah. expect them all to, to adhere to that right level yeah. of discipline even yeah and yeah. yeah you like really how long was it going to take before darth vader uh, rose <laughs> that, right there was a darth vader somewhere out there yeah. it just happened to be yeah <laughs> then and and then yeah so um yeah i suppose that's a good argument uh, for it i think of the other thing too is like do the jedi deny I don't want to use the word, I guess I have to use the word humanity, but do they deny their own humanity, even though we're talking about all kinds of alien species that also participate, (laughs) but there, this level of sentience, right? Where you essentially eliminate for our easy ease of understanding, like what makes you human, right? What differentiates, you know, the perfect Jedi from a robot, you know, other than he says he's compassionate, but if he doesn't feel love, you know, or he doesn't feel you know, happiness or joy or any anything that could be misconstrued as a self-centered emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, are they going too far in trying to eradicate all their feelings and all attachment? Yeah. And, and you do wonder, like, with the way that the order is, I wonder if it's, um, it's almost like a necessity that you have people who are completely devoted to the cause and don't have anything pulling away their... Uh, 
uh, their attention, right? Because if you have kids or family, yeah, you even a have, wife, yeah, you could end up with competing yeah, interests, exactly. Yeah. And I could see how you could think that that would lead to the dark side, right? Because yeah. it's like um, the the order is asking you almost to forsake your Everything. family's interests, and then you can that can like that can start bitterness and anger and resentment, yeah. And then you start going down the path of the dark side, and yeah. maybe twenty years later, you know, you go on a, on a spree and kill a bunch of children, right? <laughs> no one could have seen that coming. Yeah, <laughs> completely blindsided. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, I I think that's like definitely some huge flaws in the philosophy, you know. But yeah, which I mean, it's hard to say at the same time. I don't want to be too too hypercritical of the Jedi. Like you mentioned earlier, like maybe they saw things in the past and, you know, that that led them to make these rules. Uh, and it, it makes sense, like, if, if you are trying to eliminate attachment. Um, and I think the big struggle comes from, like, people willingly deciding to live that way versus just blanket recruiting everyone and then forcing them to live a certain way. And And time and again, you see Jedi leave the Order. You see Jedi fall to the dark side. And it could very well be that, like... It's just the Jedi's way of doing things creates Sith. It creates people who become disaffected. At the very least creates dark Jedi. And yeah. people who don't agree with the High Council and their decisions suddenly become the bad guys yeah. just because they disagree. I, and it is almost like a... It's sort of like a reciprocal relationship where you you wonder if the the people who like go down the dark side and go to like the extremes of the dark side, are they like, are they almost driven there by the stubbornness of the Jedi? Right. Yeah. They refuse to yeah. see things any other way. So I have to, it's almost like, uh, uh, an equal reaction, you know, like they, they, they see that the Jedi are so stubborn. So they're just gonna scream louder you know yeah. you know what i mean and get even more extreme yeah and it, it, it's almost like how extremism sort of works you yeah. know in a way it, reaction and counter reaction yeah totally yeah. yeah so yeah so as a final kind of fun fun little discussion point um it's never really clarified what the jedi's diet is consistent of but are they vegetarian now considering their you know, hardcore belief in, in the sanctity of life. Um, it's hard to imagine a Jedi, you know, killing things for sport or killing things for food. <laughs> um, unless, well, there's some philosophical discussions to be had there, which is what I'm hoping to get into here. <laughs> um, so, Jordan? Um, are the Jedi vegetarians? It's never stated anywhere or not. I mean, does it make sense for their belief system for them to be? I... I suppose so, though I could sort of see situations in which a Jedi would, like, have to survive. I, I guess in the new canon, I guess we can say that they're not they're not vegetarians because we do see Luke fish and eat. Fish. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Um, so there is that, uh, but that's more to do with the new canon. I don't know if it's ever specified anywhere. I don't know, food in Star Wars isn't really... Yeah, it's, it, there's not a... We'll do we'll do an episode on the food of Star Wars and, and what we can find, but uh, food and beverages. Yeah, <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> what does blue milk taste yeah. like? <laughs> um, yeah, Ca cantina beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. like I guess it, it might make sense, but again, I don't know of any evidence specifically that would uh, necessarily suggest that. I could maybe see like certain factions of the order maybe going kind of to that extreme of being vegetarian completely yeah. vegetarian um but i don't know it could just yeah it could just be like a discipline thing like yeah so to to me um what i think first of all there are biological constraints the jedi order encapsulates tons of different species some of which might be exclusively carnivorous right these species yeah. might die if they yeah. eat you know anything other than meat yeah totally um so one i think there's biological constraints and the other thing is i don't think the jedi are strict pacifists i think just from hearing no. what their ideology is about yeah um you might get that impression but they are willing to defend themselves they are willing to defend others 
and it, in fact they see it as a moral obligation to defend others when they see right you know someone being abused or taken advantage of yeah so in those cases i don't think even though they can respect life it doesn't mean they can't also take life yeah. and i think it's more in how life is taken um that they're allowed to do you know to kill for food for example and i think you know eating and eating also contributes to the preservation of life um things need to eat and in that it's kind of a cycle of life that they yeah. they contribute to so in, in that philosophical context you could understand like okay if they eat you know they're they're not killing out of anger aggression it's just out of need yeah in order for them to survive and that's kind of like that that creature life is given to them right right and they just join back to the force yeah and i'm sure they only eat uh non-sentient but- <laughs> non sentient or uh, free range organic. <laughs> free, yeah. None of that GMO crap. Are you stuck up, half witted, scruffy looking nerf herder? But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to give the show a five-star rating and review, and give us a follow on social media. This episode was produced and edited by me, Jordan Swaim, written and directed by Christian Lutz and Sam Swaim. All original music was scored and recorded by my music project, Farewell to Shadowland.